Church Second Service. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that wasn't very enthusiastic. <laughs> Good morning, Hope Church Second Service. Good morning. All right, supposed to be happy to be here. Now you know what? Just she came up here playing that guitar. All this time for the years I've known him, he's been carrying that thing. I thought it was just like a chick magnet when he was just using it. <laughs> Turns out he actually knows how to play it. Well, congratulations. Okay. Most of you here, in fact, none of you here ever knew my mother. But right now, somewhere in Iowa, she's flopping around in her grave seeing me standing in front of a church wearing a t-shirt. But she can get over it. These, these shirts, um, they're by our uh, Paradise Ridge Christian Hikers. And we're selling them out there if you'd like to wear them. What happens is we have six members here in this uh, crew that... Uh, they're standing right there. You stand up with your shirts on. Where's Laura and Ron? But what we're doing is, <clears throat> they're, the, they're the leaders of our Christian Hikers group, which is a ministry which is kind of cool. I don't know of any other church that has a ministry of hikers like this. But they go out and hike, and their next hike is going to be the 14th. And they're selling shirts for a lot of reasons. One, the groups that they have that they go hiking with and that hike through our church is usually like 15, 20 people. And out of them, most of them don't even go to Hope Church. Most of some of them are non-Christian, some of them aren't Christian, and some of them go to other churches. But what they're doing is, when you wear one of these shirts, you know, you go, if you wear it like other places other than when you're hiking and stuff like that, it brings people to question Christ and stuff like that. So it kind of gives you a window of opportunity to talk to people. It's kind of like wearing your Rock the Ridge shirt. It's amazing how many times I wear my Rock the Ridge hat and my Rock the Ridge shirt, and somebody will say something to you about it and ask questions. And that's kind of nice. You may be just the planting the seed that make a difference in somebody else's life. Um, we received a very nice card from Jan and Wayne Carelli thanking those of you that were praying for them and, and helping them with meals and stuff like that during Jan's surgery. It's been a real long uphill battle for her. And it's really, really great. That, and they really appreciate you, all that you've done for that. We had seven people here last night from Shore. <coughs> for those of you who don't know, it's a great outreach program. We open up our church and uh, allow homeless folks to spend the night here on Saturday nights. And, and then we, some people come down here and make meals for them and stuff. So a great outreach program. And I'm very proud to be affiliated with the church that does stuff like that. Yesterday, the women had a program here. They had 30 to 40 women in here for Unwrap the Bible. And I think we were the only place on the ridge that had that telecast. And so, you know, the gals that put that together, and everybody had a really good time, and I just thank you for doing that. It's kind of good to see that. <clears throat> Next Saturday is what? Men's breakfast. Men's breakfast. What was that? <laughs> That's more like it. It has a lot of fun. And next Saturday is going to be a specifically good breakfast because we don't have to clean up afterwards because the women are having their craft fair right after that. And so I'll take care of my stuff. I just imagine that's going to work out. Anyway, next Sunday night, 5 o'clock, we're having our annual hoedown, which is a funny name for things, here at the church. And there'll be some dancing. There'll be a chili cook-off. There'll be a pie auction. And it's a good time to find out that there are other people that come here at 9 o'clock that some of you have never even seen before. But there's actually, we, we do this at 9 also, just in case any of you happen to be around. So it's a good time to meet these people, dance. And uh, it's funny because they always have a comedian do the dancing, so it's no real serious dancing. And this is not some Fred Astaire kind of operation. <laughs> these are the uh, plaques that we're having made. Memorial plaques. Uh, is there anybody here that hasn't gone to a memorial garden? Raise your hand. You guys are easy. Oh, you're easy. What's the matter with you? Why didn't you? You just born yesterday? Yeah. Anyway, we, we have a great memorial garden right around behind the church, and it's open 24 hours a day. It has a fountain and, and, and a, uh, <coughs> some, some wood up there. They're actually memorializing family members, people that you love passed away that you'd like to have memorialized. I brought this in here. This is just the uh, the actual plaques that they're putting up there. There's some of them up there already. It's open 24 hours a day. You can you go out there and pray, you know, come by here. I know a lot of people that have come by here at night in the evenings, they see 
all kinds of animals out there, skunks and, I mean, deer and <laughs> raccoons and things. So, <clears throat> okay, let me see what else. Most important event of the day, and this is really a special one. For those of you that have uh, never been here one, during one of our baptisms, we're having a baptism right after I quit talking. And so you don't get up and jump around and go meet somebody, just sit around for the baptism. But this is a really specifically one important. Dear to my heart, it's a father and a son. And the son was the one that wanted to be baptized, and he asked if his father would come with him to be baptized. And it's just fantastic for a young man to learn Christ so young. So here we go. Without further ado. Because Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I commanded you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So we, because we're just followers of Jesus, nothing more, nothing less, we follow that teaching. And he himself was baptized too, so it's really cool that you're following his example. And uh, you no, know, I know you were um, dedicated at a young age, and that you've been asking about this, and it's really cool that you have that spiritual hunger. I had a good mom that helped me when I was young to think about that, and I think that's, you're really blessed now to have a mom and a dad that's um, leading you in this way, and I think God's got a great destiny for you in the kingdom as you keep following him. So basically we ask two things. We ask a belief question because the church is built on the belief on who Jesus is. And so I'm going to ask you both at this time, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose on the grave, rose from the grave after uh, dying for your sins? Another thing that we have as a family tradition here at Hope um, is a confession we make. Paul says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and Father. We don't like to wait to that day. We like to do it at our baptism. So would you like to make that confession? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Because of your belief in Jesus, Zach, and your willingness to follow him as the Lord of your life, I now joyfully baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
criticized for spending time with sinners, but he said, I have come to seek and save the lost. Even though many were against his life and teaching, there are many who were touched by his love. His death on the cross, the ultimate display of love that Jesus showed for all of us. Let's remember the sacrifice of his body, his blood for our sins. Because of his love, we are free.
Sunday second service. We're glad to be here today. Good to see you all. Thank you for being here. If you're watching online, thanks for tuning in also. What's that? I like it. So I, uh, I love that Battle Cry has a few songs that they typically don't do because they wanted to give you a different set than Rock the Ribs. They even did a song they haven't done. And then the last song they did, Keegan wrote that song that we just sang. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. When you have a revival and revolution and all that in history, they always say that uh, people are writing new songs and singing new songs or singing old songs new ways. And so it's really cool that we've got um, these guys, that these our bands and our artists that we have in our church. Uh, about three days ago, I got in the car to go celebrate my birthday with my wife. She got a sweet deal at uh, the beachcomber there in Fort Bragg, which I love because you can look at the ocean the whole time. Yeah. And uh, I, I woofed down a little bit of leftover uh, veggie stir fry from the night before. And then we got about midway on the road and I started feeling some rumblings, you know? And I'm like, was it the veggies or what was it? And, uh, it wasn't long, I figured out it was more than the veggies, that it was something that was gonna hang out with me for a while, which really makes for a romantic trip, you know? <laughs> nice restaurants, beautiful view, and multiple uh, restroom trips. But uh, my life was sweet. I did go on a, on a bike ride with her, and it's a really cool, there's a trail right there that uh, I know some of you have been there, and you, you can go uh, two miles north and come back. So we did that, we came back, and then you can keep going if you want. It's, that's four miles, I'm, done. I'm so done, because I'm just hurting, and, and uh, I knew she was gonna keep going. She goes, you wanna go a little farther? Go ahead, I'm gonna enjoy the view. So uh, she got another couple miles in, but I sat there, and uh, one of the things that I did while I, I sat around and enjoyed the view was think about you and how blessed I am to be a pastor of this church. And I don't take you for granted. And I'm thankful for you guys. And, and I'm thankful to God for letting me work at this church. And um, I also thought about the, it was so cool the la what the ladies were doing yesterday with the Unwrap the Bible. And I watched, I saw some videos and I saw some pictures and it looked like it was going great. And then when I got back to talk to some sisters and they said it was awesome, I want to thank Amanda. And she, she cast the vision to Gina and, and did the work and the leg work. And thank you to all those who worked with her to, to do this. It's really cool because I don't think there was another a simulcast going on in our region, or at least our general area. And it's really cool to have ladies come here. Um, there was, um, there, there's a belief that I have that I've seen that in growing churches, over half the growth comes from women. Some of you are like, duh. And uh, <laughs> uh, Jesus had women involved in his ministry, as you know, and uh, Paul did too. And so it's really cool to have some sisters getting inspired here by some of the best teachers in the country. So that's really an awesome thing. Uh, so 10 Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe is a series I want to do. It's from a book uh, by a guy named Larry Osborne. I've had it for a while. It's, I think it's about 10 years old. And uh, I wanted to do a series on it for a while. Um, it's no news flash that smart people can do some pretty dumb things. Uh, but the premise of this series is about something we also can forget, that some people, some smart people, can believe some pretty dumb things. And you can look at history. I have the examples of Napoleon and Galileo and IBM. Napoleon was this, you know, this uh, genius in warfare and strategy, military genius. And he thought the harsh Russian winter would be no match for his troops. And they were well trained and equipped, but he didn't have a shred of historical evidence to support his decision to march on. And why is it other scientists and great thinkers in Galileo's day who could see the same evidence, they ignored the evidence and branded him a heretic and a quack? And then more recent, IBM, all this incredible leadership, brilliant leadership team, IBM bet the farm on mainframes and practically gives away the PC and the op underlying operating system to a young geek named Bill Gates. And all of these decisions, and many, many more through history, 
were made by people a lot smarter than me, and yet, in hindsight, they look like idiots. What happened uh, in each case? An, an otherwise intelligent person badly misinterpreted the facts, made incorrect assumptions, or relied upon information that we now know to be completely false with disastrous consequences. Sometimes they were confused by cultural bias, uh, which at times can be strong, uh, so strong that it literally blinds us to the truth. Cultural bias is what everybody thinks. And you know, sometimes I had a, a prof once in the university, he, he talked to us about common sense, and he said, uh, you know, we, we brag on people with good common sense, which, I, I, and I do that, I love people that have a sense of down-to-earth wisdom about them, but he said, sometimes common sense is wrong. And I hadn't thought about that, but sometimes the things that everybody thinks is wrong. And uh, so sometimes people are impacted to make decisions based on what everybody says. There's also this, sometimes I've seen this happen, where people make decisions based on wishful thinking, not on what the scripture really says. They, they just know, they just believe so firmly that it's the right decision, that they kind of project it onto God, and it's wishful thinking. History is full of examples of intelligent people who, upon, uh, who make uh, amazingly goofy assumptions and pay high prices. And I want to use words like goofy and dumb and stupid in this series because, and I know in a big in a group there's always somebody that might not like it. And maybe it's a mom wanting to have their kids have a little better vocabulary. But to try to say, not the brightest ideas that uh, some people believe. You know, it's just to try to water down, I don't think does us justice because it's dumb and it's stupid because of the results that it has in someone's life. If they believe in something that is not true and they bet the farm and they base their life on it, they can be sadly disappointed. And, and I, I, I call that the high price of flawed assumptions um, that I got from Osborne, the high price of flawed assumptions we Christians are not immune. Even if highly moral, deeply sincere, smart Christians with the best theological background and training, we have no guarantee of protection from the consequences of bad decisions based on flawed assumptions. Osborne calls it the, uh, the wisdom, quote, the wisdom of Solomon plus inaccurate facts or faulty assumptions equals a fool's decision. Foolish is a biblical word. Idiots or stupid or dumb is a contemporary word that means the same thing. And I've seen people make life-altering decisions based on what they perceive to be biblical principles only to discover too late that they, what they thought was biblical didn't come from the Bible. Now, most of the time they were victims of a spiritual urban legend. And I have a definition of a spiritual urban legend. A spiritual urban legend is just like a secular urban legend. It's a belief, story, assumption, or truism that gets passed around as fact. And uh, the source can be a friend. It could be a Sunday school teacher. It could be a pastor. It could be in a small group. And it's someone you look up to. And they seem so spiritual and everything. And they're reputable. And so it's accepted this spiritual urban legend is, is accepted without question and then quickly passed on. It's circulated, and once widely disseminated, they tend to take on a life of their own. Sometimes you start hearing of conferences about this theme from this spiritual urban legend. Sometimes denominations or parts of them go off on a bent on this doctrine, on the spiritual urban legend, which is so sad because it's not true, and they're, they're basing their whole agenda on it. And anyone who dares to question the veracity gets written off as spiritually dull, lacking in faith, or you're just liberal. The consequences of some spiritual misconceptions aren't particularly devastating. Like, if you want to believe that it says in the Bible that God helps those who help themselves, you, you can believe that, but it's not going to help you. I mean, you know, it's not going to injure you too much. If you want to believe that God says in the Bible that a penny saved is a penny earned, you know, it's probably not going to devastate you. If, if you want to believe that Jesus was this sort of 
soft-skinned, Western European guy with blue eyes who walked from town to town in an old bathrobe saying profound things in a wispy voice, kind of a mystical hippie on drama me. It, it'll throw you off a degree or two, but it'll still hardly destroy your faith. But the reason for this series is there's more serious things that spiritual legends, spiritual urban legends aren't just harmless, uh, they're misunderstandings, and they spiritually can be dangerous errors that will eventually bring heartache and disillusionment. That's why I want to do this, because people trust in them, and then they get their heart broken. Too often, people uh, have consequences that are spiritually devastating. They, they set their life on something that they thought God promised to do, and God never promised to do that, so they write God off. Or they uh, are, are devastated or in despair because they follow the step of faith and it turns to be a leap on the ice. And God never told them to do that. And that's why we're going to spend 10 weeks on looking at these blatantly false spiritual urban legends. We're going to explore them because it's important. There aren't, they aren't just harmless. They're misunderstandings. They're spiritually dangerous errors that will eventually bring heartache and disillusionment to all who trust in them. And you may already recognize a few of them. Others you may have questioned already, but you might be thinking, oh, I'm not the only one that questions that one. Uh, some may rock your boat or think just because of your back, background. It's not, I'm not trying to be insulting because there's spiritual urban legends that I believed growing up and that some people, some mentors helped me to, to encourage me to examine with an open mind and with an open Bible. You know, there's an there's a old carpenter's adage, measure twice, cut once. And that old adage is based on the observation that once you cut a board too short, no matter how many times you cut it, it'll still be too short. And the same holds true for spiritual principles on which we base our life. Once we've made a decision or set a course of actions, it's usually too late to go back and to start checking out the accuracy of those assumptions. And the example I wanted to use today in the intro as we look ahead at this series we're going to go into is the example of the Bereans. The Bereans. It says in Acts 17, uh, verse 11, that the Bereans were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica because they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. First of all, we don't use the word noble a lot, but... Um, it's a compliment, and if your boss at work says, I found you a very noble person, or writes that a little write-up, you're going to go home and say, guess what, I didn't check this out, what the boss said. Or if someone you respect, you look up to, uh, calls you a person of noble character, that's a great compliment. Here's a way that we can know that God thinks we, the creator of the universe, can say you have noble character if you search the scriptures. And it says they did it every day with eagerness. It wasn't like, oh, Bible reading, Jesus, well, uh, it's good for today. You know, it was eagerness, searching. And they were checking somebody out. Who were they checking out? Paul. 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 Who was Paul? An apostle. He was an apostle. He was that guy who went from persecutor to proclaimer. He was a church planter. Um, the missions came out of Paul. They were in Jerusalem before Paul. And Paul was a big leader in missions. And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. So you kind of get the idea that God thinks pretty highly of them. And yet God thinks highly of people who search the scriptures to check out what Paul is saying to see if it's true. And that's why I want you, Hope, to feel free any time to say, show me a thus saith the Lord. Show me in the book for what you're teaching. You see, that's what keeps us from being manipulated by authoritarian freaks, you know, or cults, or people. They say, well, the Bible said that for a time, but now we've got revelation from God. The Bible never says that's going to happen, that there's going to be a time in the Bible. The Bible says that it ha it's all you need. I do believe the Spirit works in us and uses the, the, the Word as the sword of the Spirit, and He can put things on our heart and open and, and help us in, in spiritual wisdom. But you got to be very careful about all the time saying, God told me this, and God told me to do that. And you better make sure He's not telling you to do something that's opposite what you read in Scripture because that's not God telling you to do that. And sometimes good spiritual friends will tell you what God wants you to do. And you got to check the scriptures. And I'm so thankful that in my journey, I had some people who took me aside and said, look at the context of the scripture and look at the background of the book 
and read the whole book, before and after verses in the book, before you go jumping all over the Bible to get a little verse here, a little here that kind of says the same thing, and proof text your argument. Look at the context, because the book's going to tell you what it means by the words that you're reading. And uh, groups that take little pieces of the Bible out of context do a lot of harm. Well, it says you should hate your father and mother in Luke 14, so I guess I can't talk to my parents anymore. I'm in this cult now, and i got to love them more than my... my. No, when you read the context, Jesus says, compared to me, you got to love less. And he, Luke uses a strong word, hate, on purpose, because I should hate anything in me or anything or any resource or any person that would try to drag me away from Jesus. I should have an unrivaled commitment with him. But he never tells me to, to not love my parents. Or love. In fact, the Bible has always said, honor your parents. So you see what I mean? There's some groups that pull people away from their biological families, guilt-tripping them with a, by taking a verse completely out of context. My hope in this series is that you'll do the same, that you'll study, that you'll toss aside the cliches, the Christian happy talk, the, the cultural assumptions that don't fit what the Bible actually says or the way that life really works, and that your trust in God as the ultimate source of, of spiritual truth will grow. That's what happens when you quit believing what everybody says and you go with your gut and what God's been saying to you and you study it and you step out based on what you're reading in Scripture, you begin to realize whether people like you or not, it's God's will and God's word and that's a whole lot better. You know, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, some translations say continue in my word. But it's the idea of dwelling, living in his word. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth never binds, truth sets you free. That's why I told my kids when they went off to the university, truth has nothing to fear. Don't you be afraid to examine and search the scriptures. You don't have to throw your brain out to become a follower of Jesus. Go to the mat and struggle and grapple and be open-minded because that's sometimes we learn our greatest new truths when we're open instead of just believing what everybody else already said and assuming it to be true. I grew up in, a, in an era where the group that I came from a lot of times thought or acted like we were the only true church. They wouldn't say that verbally all the time, and now they've changed a lot, and there's a lot of I call it the G word. It's been getting a hold of some other congregations, you know, Grace. But uh, uh, and, uh, but we were very conservative. And there's a lot of good that I learned. And I thank God for where I came from. And I thank my teachers. And they taught me about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and a lot of wonderful things to base my life on from Scripture. But this idea, it was kind of like, uh, Nathan, only me and you are going to heaven, but I'm not sure about you. You know, that was kind of the mindset. If you had the right name on the building, if you had all the... The, the, li the linear list of doctrines, you were going to be okay, and you have the truth. And now I love saying to people who become members at Hope or are thinking about becoming members that we are not the only Christians. We're Christians only. Nothing more, nothing less. And, I, and, and we're not here to judge other groups. God's got people in all kinds of groups. Different kinds of churches reach all kinds of people. And, and, I'm, not, and I'm, I'm saying this not to be condescending. I'm saying it took some courage from me, some guts from me, to be a part of a place where I grew up and was trained to start saying, no, I don't swallow that. I don't swallow that. And then there was the whole music thing. You know, and I struggled with, I don't struggle with certain people liking one style of music or another style. What I struggle with is when one group says, this is the only kind that God likes. This is more spiritual. Because in scripture, there is no such thing as Christian music. You cannot find a definition in the pages of scripture. This isn't one of the ten, by the way. I'm just doing this in the intro to kind of tell you how it has helped me to, 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 to not accept dumb things. Because I don't believe that the music that Paul used and Jesus used was like what we did or like what my parents did. And I know for a fact my mom worshipped the Lord with all her heart in her way. It, her last... Uh, Worship experience in a church was right back here before Christmas, before last, and she loved it. Not her style, not her style of worship, but she loved it because she knows her boy is worshiping, and we're worshiping, and I know in her way she's worshiping. So it's not that I'm saying one's better or bad. What I'm saying is it's wrong when we say one is more spiritual or one accepted by God, because the only thing that makes music Christian is the lyrics. That's the only thing. Style has nothing to do with it. And, and uh, I, I was talking to my group about some of this kind of stuff, my, my noon group on Wednesday, and one of the sisters said, 
She told me about, uh, she wanted her teen boy to come to church really bad. He was getting into the goth scene and, you know, dressing with a goth look and the dark and all that and his friends. And he finally got him to come and she, she said that he brought a few of his friends and she was so excited that they came. And she said they came in and they sat down and him and all his friends with the goth attire on sat down and people scooted away from them. When I heard that, I was pissed off. Because I know that God hates that. God hates that. You know, when Jesus was in the synagogue, he goes, is he going to try to heal on the Sabbath? And there's a guy there with a withered hand. And Jesus, he says he looked around at them in anger. You know why? Because they care more about their rules and their spiritual urban legends than a guy with a withered hand. And he heals them in front of them. And so I say, let's continue to be free and examine. And I, I love that you've done that, Hope. You have accepted people. You've accepted me, right? And uh, you have... Uh, you've loved me, and, and I believe that's a part of, of the journey with God is to be free. If you think you got it all figured out, I'm sorry for you, because it's a journey. It's a journey. I'll tell you one more. That's not part of the ten. Can I tell you one more? Bring when, it. When someone picks a date when Jesus is going to come and starts telling everybody, this is the, that is so stupid. That is just dumb. It is dumb. We look like idiots. And people have done it through the centuries, and they take a little bit of Daniel, they get into this apocalyptic stuff, literature, which, by the way, never says, here's the exact date, right? Sometimes the passage in Revelation, John's saying, hey, I'm writing to you about some things that are shortly going to come to pass. Now, if you are there, 80, 60, possibly, Domitian's reign, horrible persecution, and you get this letter that says, don't worry, in 2,000 years, I'm going to come save everybody. I don't think it was very encouraging. A lot of revelation was to the people or what they're going through. I believe some things in Matthew 24, example, were about the destruction of Jerusalem. So I believe there is a time he talks about end times, and there is a time when he talks about uh, shortly come to pass. But here's the deal. Whether he comes in my life or your life now, he's still quick. You know what I'm saying? It's right. still short. I think, and Jesus himself said, I don't know the day or the hour. Only the Father knows. So why in the world would I want to go around and say, I figured it out, and I'm going to buy a billboard, and I'm going to scare the hell out of people <laughs> and scare them into heaven? That's another part of that thing that is stupid. We, and I used to do it when I started the ministry. We try to scare people out of hell and scare them into heaven. When the gospel is so much more than this scare tactic, the gospel is good news. The gospel is called grace. The gospel is you can come as you are. And he loves you so much that he died on a cross to prove it. You don't have to earn yourself. There's not this way of Christian dresses and talks and has happy talk and cool cliches and everything's wonderful. No, it's, we go through a lot of hard times. But I believe this. I believe there was no heaven or hell, which I believe there is because Jesus said there is. But if there was no heaven or hell, it's still worth it knowing God. Now, for knowing God, not for getting out of hell for having a relationship with my creator. And, and, and even if I, uh, I'm i wrong at the end of this thing, and I got it wrong and it wasn't true, I want to live a better life because he taught me to love God and love people and love my neighbor. Otherwise, I'd be a selfish jerk and do whatever I want. And so it's stupid to try to pinpoint a time and scare people when, when Jesus, I think, says, live every day like it's the last and someday you'll be right. And just having my 59th birthday, I'm realizing it's going to come a whole lot quicker than I realized. <laughs> I was talking to my daughter, and standing there looking at the ocean, and, and all my girls call me, and, and uh, I said, man, you know what, Brent? She goes, I'm, I'm really going to die. And she starts laughing. I go, I've been I've been preaching this for 30 years about how we can all die, you know, but I'm really starting to realize, I'm really going to die pretty soon. And uh, she's dying laughing, and I told her to play some Hendrix at my funeral and stuff. And then uh, uh, I get my card from my loving wife, and there's a picture of uh, Bob Dylan playing a song on the front. Oh, that's cool. She got me a rock star card. That's cool. And I open it up, and it says, enjoy your new birthday theme song. And I go, what, what was the song? And I open back up the front, and the song he's singing is Knock, Knock, Knocking on Heaven's Door. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we really win with God. We get him. We get to know him. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that you may know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, who means him. That's the heaven right now. We know him, and we have eternal life now. It's not just sucking up. It sucks now, but someday you're going to heaven. Knowing him, C.S. Lewis uh, said, if you went to hell, would you still go to worship? 
And his point was that God is still worth it because that he is so awesome. He is so awesome. Not that we want to go to hell. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, and, and so I want, to, I want to just say one last thing uh, on this as we close the intro, and then we'll, we'll kick it off. I hope you'll bring your friends uh, or invite them. I mean, if, if they come, I'll try not to embarrass them because I think it might be good for our friends to hear some of this stuff. And the, the, the last thing, that one of the things that was a really big aha moment for me in my journey was when I really started digging into scriptures and I found out that God loves me with an everlasting love. That there's nothing you can do to get God to love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. He's not this old guy that's really ticked off up there with a lightning bolt, ready to zap me. Would you get it right? Would you get it right? He loves you just as you are. We sang just as I am when I was a kid, but I didn't get it that I could come. I think I learned it from DC Talk. I could come as I am. And uh, that was such good news because I know there's some things that aren't right and I need grace. But God is love. You know, when I read that verse where Paul says that we through the Spirit in us, we can cry, Abba, Father, that that's like saying, Daddy? Wait, is that disrespectful to the creator of the universe, Daddy? And my teacher said, oh, that's what God's like. He loves you. And then all of a sudden, this massive, everything opened up for me. The, the prodigal son, where the, the son goes, he asks for his inheritance, and Jesus, Jesus is telling the story. The dad says, sure, go ahead and take it. The dad hasn't died. The Jewish audience would be going, what? And the son goes, and he ends up in a pig's pen eating eating the pig's food, which is not a good place for kosher Jewish boys. Are you with me? He <laughs> wastes his inheritance on whores and sinful living, and he comes back, and his dad, who is God, doesn't just go, well, we'll see now. He doesn't stand. It's, it's almost like he's been looking for him. He sees him walking, and he runs to meet him, and he throws a party for his son, and, and his son's like, I'm not worthy to be your son. I've, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. Make me like one of your servants, and he says, quick, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals, all that's royalty, and he wraps around that covering that son. He's covered. It's like we're covered in Christ. The only person who gets mad at the seed is the religious brother who says, I've been serving you all this time and you've never killed a fat calf for me. And he says, my son, you were here with me all along, but your son, your brother who was dead, now he's been found, he's been saved. And that's when I had a huge aha moment. That's, I mean, there was even dancing going on in the house. He threw a party, singing and dancing. God celebrates. You know, it says that heaven celebrates when one person comes back to the one, one person comes to the Lord, heaven erupts in a celebration. That's a trip to think about. Maybe that's where thunder comes from. You know, Michael and Gabriel high fiving. <laughs> <laughs> Those two guys that were baptized, they had the courage to let a pastor with stomach flu baptize them, pray for them. Um, not only were you and I all rejoicing, heaven. It's a humbling thing to think of. Heaven erupted in a celebration. Amen. Amen. That's so cool. And so you believe the truth. You believe the love of God. Take the love of God. And you don't have to care what anybody else thinks. There's spiritual urban legends out there. Don't let yourself be hurt by them. Amen? Let's pray together. Amen. Father, I pray for us to be truth seekers, to not be so bound in tradition or fear <clears throat> that we miss out on the goodness of your truth. And it also scares me to think that we could we can preach a gospel that's flawed where people believe things falsely about your promises and it sets them up for disappointment. And so, Lord, help us as we study the truth and help us to know that, uh, the truth. And I pray for people to be encouraged in their faith, for people to be encouraged to realize they can understand your will and your word. And those things that you don't answer, we live by faith in but we don't have it in, all in a box, and you're not in a box. And God, if there's someone here that hasn't crossed the line yet, give them the courage to just step forward to say in their heart, let, make yourself known to me, Lord, and I pray that you will. And if there's anyone we can help in that decision, help us to be help, helpers and, as we are all just followers and disciples. And we commit to uh, be like the Bereans, to search the scriptures to see if these things are true, and we don't care what anybody else thinks, but you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship. <laughs>